just a very quick recap from last week. We said that if we are to study the Word of God, we have to ask four questions. Observation, interpretation, correlation, and application. Observation where you normally say, what does text say? Interpretation, what does it actually mean? Correlation, are there other verses or passages in the Scripture that can explain what I'm reading? And then the fourth, uh, what will I do about it? What will I do about it? We saw last week from observations, there were two things that we, was happening here. But just before we go over that, maybe we can read sections. Maybe these sections on the right, you read from verses 19 to 24. And then on my left, from Edith to the left, you can read uh, from 25 to 30. How about that? So on my right, your left, 19 to 24. And then on my left, your right, from 25 to 30. This is from the NIV. From last week, we saw two things. As I said, um, it looks like a very plain passage, nothing a lot in it, until you apply those four um, tests or four steps of observation, interpretation, correlation, application. Two things we observed. Number one, from verse 19, Paul intends to send two men to Philippi. Do you see that? I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you. And we also see in verse 25, the other man was Epaphroditus or Epaphroditus. That's the first thing we see. He intends, Paul intends to send two men, and they are named Timothy and Epaphroditus. The second thing we saw in these verses is the fact that Paul highly endorsed these two guys. Highly endorsed these two guys. He wanted us to take note. Verse 20, speaking of Timothy, I have no one else like him. I have no one else like him. And as we said last week, out of the 27 books of the New Testament, Paul wrote 14 of them. He was a scholar. He was the top of the tops. 
And here he is giving a commendation to Timothy that is no small thing. For Paul to say, I have no one else like Timothy. I have nobody else in the world like Timothy. And we said last week, if Paul says that about you, you are very, very famous. In fact, so famous, since the Bible was written, Timothy's name and Epaphroditus have been mentioned. I don't know how many, in many sermons, but so long as the Bible exists, those two guys will be mentioned. In verse 29, talking about Epaphroditus, welcome him and honor men like him. Honor men like him. Basically, Paul was saying, honor these kind of guys. So, that's the observation. And so, it leads us to the question, why honor them? What have they done that deserves the honor? Why are they worthy of honor? Why did they deserve to be praised? What are these guys actually doing in their lives that are so special? Now, five things. If you look at the next page. We note five things about these two guys. First, about Timothy, verse 21, it says, He takes genuine interest in your welfare. Genuine interest in your welfare. Then in verse 22, in the NIV, again in front of you, it says, Timothy has proved himself. Has proved himself. Talking about Epaphroditus, verse 25, Paul calls him my brother, my co-worker, my fellow soldier. So, when you look at those words, genuine interest in your welfare, proved himself, my brother, my co-worker, my fellow soldier, you have to ask yourself, Wow, what do those words mean? In verse 26, it says about Epaphroditus, He longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Verse 30 says, He nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. So that's the observation. Paul is sending two guys to Rome, Timothy and Epaphroditus. He highly commends them. He said we ought to honor men like these guys. Why? Because of five commendable characteristics that we've just looked at. Second part is interpretation. So that's just a mere observation. You're just reading the text, and that's what you picked up, just from observing. And remember last week I said the difference between reading the Bible and studying the Bible is three words, pen and paper. You're not studying until you're writing something down. If you're not writing anything down, you're not studying. You're just reading. Interpretation. There are five marks from those very five points we looked at. Five marks of a godly man or a godly woman. If you want God's power in your life, remember what we said last week that according to 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God. Remember? All scripture is inspired by God including the ones that we are looking at right now. So if you want the power of God to flow in your life, you better study His Word. We better look at why these guys are worthy of honor, and especially those five, five characteristics. 
So let's go back to those five things again that you see mentioned there. He's taking a genuine interest, proved himself, my brother, my fellow worker, fellow soldier, longs for all of you and is distressed, almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life. In verse 20, Paul says, I have no one else like Timothy who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone else looks out for their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. Paul was basically saying in that text, this is very, very unusual. That's very rare. All of you who are reading this text, you don't see that kind of person today. Because the motto of today is I, me, and myself. But what you're reading over there is he shows genuine interest for your welfare, for your well-being. You may have picked up already that I've been using different translations when you see in these five characteristics. Let's look at the number one. Did you know that I looked up my Bible app and I counted some 52 translations on there? 52 translations. So, it's good to actually read what other translations have to say. In verse 21, I have no one else like him who takes genuine interest in your welfare, for everyone else looks out for his own interest. And then in the uh, TEV, English version, it says, genuinely cares for you. Others only care about themselves. From the Phillips translation, they are all wrapped up in their own affairs. It gives you a very good picture of what Paul is trying to paint, why this kind of behavior of Timothy is very, very, very rare. He genuinely shows interest in yourself. First characteristic is caring. The first characteristic of a godly man is caring. I hope you have a pen with you. Number one is caring. As I said before, our culture today is very much on self-centeredness, not unselfish. For example, have you um, heard, seen ads, read in the newspaper? You will see things like, we do it all for you. Have it your way. You deserve the best. You deserve a break today. Look out for number one. I've got to think about what's best for me. When you look at everything that's before us, none of them teaches you how to be unselfish. None. All music, all movies, all TV shows, all novels, magazines, video games, they are all about the consumer. What you can get out of it. Paul says about Timothy, I have no one else like this man. Because he cuts right across the norm that we see. A godly woman, a godly man is somebody who truly cares, says Paul. Number two, a godly man, a godly woman is verse 22 has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. In the work of the gospel. In God's words translation of that same verse, but you know what kind of person Timothy proved to be. Proved to be. Proved to be. 
Number two. So first is caring. Number two is consistent. Consistent. That's what those words meant. He has proved himself. He has proved himself. In fact, in the original Greek, it simply means tested, verified, checked out, determined, reliable. He's proved himself. That's what it's talking about. He's been tested, verified, checked out, and he's been determined very, very reliable. This guy is dependable. This guy is reliable. He has been proven faithful. The greatest ability in life is dependability. Can you depend on someone? Not someone who is flip-flop. They don't follow through what they promise. We want somebody who is consistent. And that's what this Bible verse is talking about. Proven and trustworthy, not wishy-washy, dependable, faithful, keep their word, men and women of conviction and character. We said last week that the difference between an opinion and character is that an opinion, you argue about it, but a conviction, you're prepared to die for it. That's what Paul is saying about this Timothy guy. It's been said that if you don't stand for something, you would fall for anything. Number three, look at verse 25. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. In a good news Bible, it says, I have thought it necessary to send you our brother Epaphroditus, who has worked and fought by my side. Now, I want you to take note of those three words, my brother, co-worker, fellow soldier. My brother, co-worker, fellow soldier. Those are relational words. They are metaphors, but they are relational. And each metaphor has something in common. The third characteristic of a man, of a woman of God, is cooperative. Cooperative. They cooperate. Paul says of this man, Bathratitis, he says that he is my brother, my co-worker, my fellow soldier. Why? Because the Christian life is a family, is a fellowship, is a fight. A family, a fellowship, a fight. Did you know that if you were to look up the words brother and sisters in the Bible, they are mentioned 133 times. And in fact, the, the, the history of Christianity shows that this is how they used to relate to one another. My brother, my sister in Christ. For thousands of years, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so. Very, very important. The church is a family, a fellowship, and it's a fight. It's not an institution. The Bible tells us to treat older women, for example, as mothers, to treat older men as fathers, to treat younger women as sisters, and younger men as brothers. Why is that? Again, because we're a family, God's family, God's children. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. But not only a family, but we are a fellowship. We are fellow workers. The best definition of fellowship that I came um, to was two fellows on a ship. 
fellowship. This, this means that we have the same task, the same mission. We're going somewhere on that boat. We're heading towards heaven. We have a task while we are alive. We are here to work together, to serve together. We are fellow workers. We are co-laborers. But that last phrase, fellow workers, also gives you the idea we are comrades, arm in arm, fellow soldiers in this battle. We have one enemy. His name is Satan. One enemy against us, every woman. When you sum all of that up, cooperative. A godly man, a godly woman is cooperative. Paul says when you see a man, a woman like that, you've got to honor them because they are very, very rare, extremely rare. So, if you hear somebody who says something like, I don't really need to go to church. I don't really need to belong to a small group. What they're actually saying is they don't really know what they need. They need other Christians. You see, the reality is the reason why the, the Holy Spirit gives us those nine gifts, 12 gifts in the other version, it's because nobody has it all. We need one another. We must lean on one another. A godly woman, a godly person, is someone who cooperates. There is no such thing as lone ranger in Christianity. So you need someone who can get along easily, can be cooperative, who plays as a team member, team player, knows how to give and take. As I said before, if you really study this, you will see though Paul was indeed a superstar, now you have to be a superstar to, to basically write half of the New Testament, inspired by the Holy Spirit, yet he said in those words that I have no one like Timothy and this man, Epaphroditus. He risked his life. He talked about how awesome the characters of these guys. In other words, he was saying better together is better. He was talking about cooperation. Though he was so, so, so intelligent, he was a Pharisee. He was quite an intellectual guy, very, very influential. And yet, he said, take note of these two guys. Even Paul himself knows that together is better. He recognizes that we need each other, godly men and godly women, to work together with someone who's not difficult but is relational cooperative, someone who is caring, someone who is consistent, someone who is cooperative. Number four, look at verse 26. For he, Epaphroditus, longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Note the emotional tone in that verse. He longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. He was ill. You have to ask, what is going on here? Why did God have to include something like this in the Bible? Now remember what we said last week in the uh, in the background, the book of Philippians was a thank you note from Paul who is in Rome. He's in prison. And he was sending a thank you note. So, they are in Philippi or in Greece nowadays. 
and they want to send this gift to Paul. Paul is in prison. And one of the men in the church in Philippi, his name is Epaphroditus, put his hand up and said, I'll take it. Now, when you do the study of the time, you realize for Epaphroditus to say, I would do it, that is quite a risky thing. I looked up the map. It's at least about 800 miles, 1,200 k's. In those days, there were no airplanes, there were no cars, there were boats. It meant that he was going to walk from Greece to Italy. Think about it. For him to put up his hand and say, I will take that offering. And in those days, there were lots of bandits. You can get attacked as soon as you start the trip. It's no small thing, which is why Paul is mentioning his name. He's a businessman who was taking this gift from the Philippi to Paul. When you put that all together, when Epaphroditus said, I will take it, he was actually putting his life on the line. Great personal expense. Look at those words again. He longs for all of you in his distress because you heard he was ill. In fact, it goes on to verse 30. It says he nearly died. Personal expense. No small thing for Epaphroditus to do this. Obviously, he was sick, maybe on the way. To walk from Greece to Italy, if you do the maths, probably it would take two months, maybe even three months, to complete the whole, th the whole trip. No small trip. No motels those days. And obviously the guys in Philippi were saying to Epaphroditus, we entrust you with this money. We believe that you will take this to Paul. In other words, they believed he is a man of integrity. Epaphroditus nearly died on this mission trip. It says that He longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Who is distressed? Epaphroditus. He is sick, nearly died, and yet he's worried because the news has got back to the Philippi that he was ill. See a caring man, see a consistent man? Very unusual. He knew that he put his life on the line. He became distressed. He became concerned about their concern. He's worried about the fact that they are worried about him. Very unusual. Fourth characteristic of man of God is considerate. A godly man or godly woman is considerate. Very considerate. You are not thinking about the words. Uh, you're not just spouting out words, but you're thinking about other people. You think about what you say and how you act because they affect other people. Are you concerned about what other people are concerned about, like this guy? Do you care about what is distressing? your friend, your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, your work colleague? Are you considerate of others? Epaphroditus was. Paul says, this is why I call this guy my brother. My fellow worker. My fellow soldier. He is, 
an amazing man of God. Take note of him. He says, honor men like him. You don't come across them that often. Honor men like him. The opposite of being considerate is just to say whatever comes to your mind. You know where you see that? A baby does that. Little children do that. They just spout out. There's no filter at all. No filter whatsoever. In that f- famous passage of Scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, it says this, Love is not rude. You see, when you're not considerate, it's called being rude. You just spout out whatever you think. And that verse says, that's the opposite of true love. Love then is not rude. In other words, love has good manners. The Greek phrase of what we've been looking at about being considerate is translated does not unbecomingly or does not act inappropriately. It means Christian love does not seek to cause problems or belittle others. Christian love involves choosing appropriate actions and responses that really help other people. A godly man, a godly woman is considerate. Now for us men over here this morning, 1 Peter 3, 7 is not in your notes. But I had to put this down. Husbands, 1 Peter 3, verse 7. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives. Be considerate as you live with your wives. You see, by nature, us men bless us. In our default mode, we're not very considerate people. We just want to shoot whatever comes to mind. In the, that's the NIV version. In the New King James Version, it says to give honor to your wife in a way you think about her. To give honor. And if you were to apply that like in everyday life, it means being considerate of your wife, if you were to put both men and women, husbands and wife, you realize, believe it or not, the one main cause of separations and divorces is because of being inconsiderate. It's another word of to, uh, of describing in when you're not considered, uh, considerate of others, is selfishness. I just want to have it your way. Being inconsiderate in your decisions, talking about marriages now, when making decisions, being inconsiderate, even in the bedroom, inconsiderate of communication. Now, if I were to have... Uh, time today, I would do a, a marriage lesson on the difference between men and women, but I don't have time. Come and see me. But you will see one of the reasons why we have problems in marriage is because we don't know we are wired differently. Men and women do not think the same. But I'll give you one example. Shopping, for example. Let's just give you one example, physical example. Let's say that you want to go and buy yourself a hat, a cap, in Silver Park, right? A man, I roughly calculate this, man goes, no, makes a beeline for the shop. Probably would take him six minutes, 27 seconds. Gets there, buys the hat, $30.99, done, finished. Woman on the other side, 
on the other hand, will go past a nice shop with amazing dresses and goes in to have a look. And then when she comes out of that shop, she would walk down. Remember, this is the mall in Silver Park. She spotted a jewelry shop. She goes in there. And on and on it goes. And I calculated at the end, probably would take her two hours, $900. She eventually makes it to the hat. But the difference between a man and a woman, we are just different. Being considerate of one another is to realize that God has created us differently. We don't think the same. We don't see through the same lenses, and we are definitely male and female. There is a reason. Number five, look at verses 27 to verse 30. 27 to 30. Indeed, he was ill, almost died. Emphasize those words. Indeed, he was ill, almost died. But God had mercy on him and not on him only, but also on me to spare me uh, sorrow upon sorrow. Skip down to verse 30. He almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. Remember, Paul is writing to the people in Philippi. saying, This guy over here risked his life a long, long time. He's a businessman. He left his business, his family, and everything that, that he was doing, and he came to me. Again, as I said to you, 1,200, I think, 85 case. Yeah, 1,287 case when I did a conversion um, to the 800 miles. It's a long, long, long way from Philippi to Rome that Epaphroditus had to walk to take the gift to Paul. Look at that verse 30 again. Highlight the word risking his life. Risking his life. Risking his life. So godly men and women are caring. They are consistent. They are cooperative. They are considerate. And number five, they are very courageous. Courageous. That's what you call courage. Courage. Courageous. That's a long, long, dangerous road trip that Epaphroditus, he risked his life and almost died for the work of Christ. Risking his life to make up for the help you couldn't give me, says Paul. A godly man can be summed up in one word, fearless is fearless. Godly man is fearless. Now reread those words again. Risking his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give. You yourselves could not give. He was risking his life on behalf of his congregation, of his church. Now, a lot of people can be courageous today and say, yeah, yeah, I would take that. But most people, when you analyze and ask questions, they only do it because the end result, they will get something out of it. They will be courageous if they get something out of it, not this guy. He risked his life. He took it, knowing very well those who are waiting to take his life, knowing very well well, I don't know if COVID-19 was around there, but, but he would be sick. And he was indeed very sick. Very courageous. He risked his life for the work of Christ on behalf of his congregation. Very uncommon. Very, very uncommon. In fact, you hardly hear of such thing today. 
Most people would be courageous if they see an end result. Not this guy. It would be interesting if I were to ask you to walk from here to the South Island to take a, a gift to a church that's barely needing it. Will you do it? When it says risking his life, the Greek word um, there simply means he hazards his life. It was a hazard. And behind the word hazard in the original context, it comes from gambling, rolling the dice. That's basically what Epaphroditus was doing. He rolled the dice. He gambled on his life. He was basically saying, I'm going to roll the dice. I may or may not return. I may take this gift. I might get to Paul or I might not. But I am willing to gamble my life for Christ and his church. That's basically what he was saying to himself. I am willing to do that. I am willing to give my life for this service. So I said, a lot of people are risking their lives today, but when you look at it, they're all for worthless things, things that don't really last that much at all. How about you? Would your commitment for Christ cause you to gamble everything and anything for his service? Or is it just a convenient faith? Now, if you think about putting yourself in Epaphroditus' shoes, a lot of commentary says that he's a businessman. Now, if you were in his shoes, thoughts like, wait a minute, I've got a business to run. I've got a family to take care of. I've got kids at school. You're asking me to walk all that way? dangerous trip to do that you could have easily perhaps those thoughts went through his mind but what we've got in the text today Paul says about Timothy I've got no one like him and Epaphroditus you've got to honor men like this guy he was basically says yes yes they are all true all those things but I don't want to follow my own agenda. I'm alive because of my Christ. And you know something, my friends? When I was sitting here two years ago in the 150th anniversary of our church, what went through my mind were the men and women who gave their lives for this very building, for this very property. Yes, it was vision was there, but they offered something quite expensive in order for us where we are today. Where we are today. Gosh. That's only observation. Interpretation and correlation, we haven't got to application. So quickly, very, very quickly, as we finish off this morning, correlation. Observation, what does it say? Interpretation, what does it mean? Five characteristics of a godly man, that's what we come up with, interpretation. Correlation, what other Bible verses explain it? You basically ask the question, are there, are there other Bible verses that mention Timothy and Epaphroditus when you come to correlation. Can I find them anywhere else in the Bible? Well, yes, you do. As you can see in your notes, there are two books in the Bible dedicated to this man, Timothy. And you can go over there if we have time. You can go over there and study up the first and second Timothy. In fact, it's a second Timothy where that scripture that we use right at the start, the start all scripture is inspired by God. It was written within that book of 2 Timothy. Epaphroditus, we pick up uh, on verse uh, 18, that 
why he was there. It's because he took the offering, the love offering of the Philippi. So that's easy enough. The more complex part is ask yourself, can I find these five characteristics anywhere else in the Bible? Where will I find those five characteristics in the Bible? And that's when you will have to use a concordance. Look up the word consistent. Look up the word cooperative. Look up the word caring. Look up the word courageous. And you must use, I forgot to bring my, um, there's a King James School Strong Exhaustive uh, Concordance. Quite a thick book, but a bit big. That's used with the King James Version. Whichever version you use, you get a concordance for that version. A concordance is a word index of every word in the Bible, every word of your translation. And depending on the version you use, um, like what we've done today, a lot of that came from NIV. But if yours is a New Living Translation, you will get a concordance for the New Living Translation. If a New King James, a concordance for the New King James. If, if it's good news, a concordance and so forth. Strong, exhaustive uh, concordance. And you look up. That's correlation, very, very quickly. Uh, you also have uh, software that are very, um, very good to buy. They're not too, too dear. Uh, it's called Word Search, uh, Word Search. Um, program. It's an amazing program because if you are following what I'm saying, if you want to have a proper study of any word and you want to look up, say, five translations, you'll have lots of concordance and you'll, you will run out of room on your shelf. But if you buy a software, computer software, you can even have, have on your phone, you can see all those 52 translations at once and all their concordances and so forth. So it's not really that, uh, it's not too expensive. I think uh, my one that I paid for was only about um, $30 US. So you do the maths, what's that, $60, $70 New Zealand? It's not that much. And yet you've got a whole library in your computer, or for me, all in this phone. You can sit somewhere where you're waiting f to see somebody, and you can scroll through and do a, a quick study. There's also Logos, another software, which is very popular, a Logos program. Finally, application. Application. James 1.22 says, Be doers of the word. Be doers of the word. The application, you have to ask questions. Uh, you have to make sure it's personal. The verse you're looking at is not about Bob. It's about Gilever, right? It has to be personal. You can't read the Bible and then you think, oh, well, I wonder how Mary will apply this. I wonder how Paul will apply this. No, no, personal. It has to be personal. It has to be practical. You have to do something about it. You can't just read it and thought, wow, that was a, an amazing revelation. No, no, practical. And it has to be possible. You must be able to do it. If you can't do it, it's not possible. And you might as not have the revelation in the first place. And provable. It has to be proved to yourself and to others. You've done it. So you picture it. One of the ways of doing application is you picture it. You picture the scene in your mind. Picture Timothy, picture Epithrotitis. You say one sentence at a time, just like what we did just before. Went through, sentence by sentence, pulled it out. And then there are nine questions with the acronym Space Pits. Now, some of you have done the 201 course. Uh, I taught this in that course. Space Pits is just to uh, prop your mind. It stands for sin. P for promise, A for attitude, C for command, 
E for example, P for prayer, E for error again, uh, truth, T for truth, and is for something. Space pits. Sin. Is there a sin to confess? Is there a promise to claim? Is there an attitude to change in me? Is there a command to obey? Is there an example to follow? We talk about Philippians uh, 2, 19 to 30 here. Is there a prayer to pray? Is there an error to avoid? Is there a truth to believe? Is there something to thank God for? So, application. You go through Philippians 2, 19 to 30. Is there a sin to repent? Maybe. I get I got convicted when I was reading this. Wow, what amazing man of God. Is there a promise to claim? No. Is there an attitude to change? Definitely yes. Is there a command I need to obey? Yes. Honor men like this. Is there an example to follow? Absolutely. Five of them. Is there a prayer, uh, prayer to pray? Maybe not. Is there an error to avoid? Definitely. Don't follow what the world is saying and doing. Follow the word of God. Is there a truth to believe? Yes. If Timothy and Epaphroditus can do it, I am also a Christian. I too can do it. Is there something to thank God for? Yes. Thank you for this passage. Can you see how the application? Then, you write a sentence on what you're going to do about it. Two parts. Honor men like this. Do I know anybody in our church, other churches in our country, that are like these two guys? Do I know anyone who is caring, consistent, cooperative, considerate, courageous? If there is, it says, honor them. Honor them. What does that mean? Send them a card. Do something for them. Express your appreciation. So the first one, when you're writing out, what you're going to do is are there people like these guys, like Timothy and Epaphroditus? And the second part, which is now about you, is out of the five qualities of a man of God, of a woman of God, which one will I focus on this week? Which of those will I focus on this week? Caring, consistent, cooperative, Considerate, courageous. Do I need to be considerate if I haven't been before? Not just blurting out whatever I think, but to think first before I speak. Do I need to be courageous for the cause of Christ? Do I need to be more caring and think about other people and not just my own agenda, my own business deal, my own needs? Do I need to be cooperative and become part of a team. Join a small group. Attend church more so I can see my brothers and sisters. In conclusion, family, what we have touched on today, I know it's been a long sermon, but what we have touched on today in these five qualities, these five characteristics of a godly man and godly woman is sorely missed in society today. I purposely did this study for you to see how deep the Word of God can get to. And I'm sure if we study it again, probably we'll see something else. Because as I said, it's, um, it's a cold mind that you never hit bottom. God just continues to unload. But I purposely do this so you can see that when we say the ways of the world and the ways of God, you can see from this, from what we've just seen, seen today, they are vastly, vastly different. And men, don't we ever need men and women like this nowadays in society? Those who are caring, those who are consistent, 
you know, you can bank on their words, cooperative. They always think of the big picture of others, consider it. They are courageous. They will run for it, no matter what. Now, Rick Warren is one of my, my uh, people that, uh, heroes and leaders that I looked up to. Amazing writing. And uh, he once tweeted this, which was quite amazing. He said, you know that the sun is sitting on a culture when short, small men cast long shadows. I thought that was quite powerful. I'll read it again. You know that the sun is sitting on a culture when short, Small men cast long shadows. In other words, when we try to become gods and we thought that we own everything and we run the whole thing ourselves, it's a total opposite of what we have just read from Philippians 2, 19 to 30. We desperately need men and women like Timothy and Epaphroditus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. You have spoken crystal clear. And we thank you that as we sit here, Lord, and just ponder on what we just heard, I'm sure, Holy Spirit, you have already prompted us out of those five characters of a man, of a woman of God. You have already prompted us of which one of those I'm going to focus on this week. Because I'm not just taking up space on earth. I'm here for a mission, for a purpose, to glorify and honor you. So, Father, we pray in Jesus' name that we we will become caring, consistent, cooperative, considerate, and courageous men and women of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.